welcome to the first of two parts lectures on virtual and augmented reality. My name is Rahul Swaminathan. And what we're going to do today is go through the very basic introduction to the topic of virtual and augmented reality, look at what's been done in the past, what are the open questions, and perhaps expose you all to uh, the fields within augmented reality that include not just video or visual augmented reality, but also audio. So the first of all, the question can be, what is virtual reality or augmented reality? Um, and one can then go on, of course, and ask the question, what is reality at the end of the course, perhaps? Um, so before we dive into all those philosophical questions, let's just define what does it mean to be virtual reality or have uh, augmented reality? In fact, there's a continuous uh, or some sense of a continuum that takes you from reality, which is what we assume to be reality, is what we see and hear, and we assume that to be real. And uh, one can question that, of course. You have the reality on one extent, and then computer graphics, games, virtual environments, that's the other extreme of it, where everything is computer generated. Um, so that's the other extreme of it. And there is actually a continuum where you can say, OK, I can move smoothly from a completely real world to a completely fake or synthesized world. And everything in between is then what is termed as mixed reality. And this was exactly uh, first proposed by Paul Milgram way back in 94, who actually defined this continuum between virtuality and reality. And everything in between, as I said, is actually just mixed reality and augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, as well as something in between, which is augmented virtuality, um, are different steps in, within this continuum. So we are going to start from the very extreme, that is virtual reality, and then move slowly towards augmented reality, which is one step away from reality. So uh, a brief historical background. So the work, of course, uh, in, in the field of mixed reality started way back with computer graphics uh, in the 50s, late 50s. Um, the first work here is what I'll refer to. Actually, you can look up the rest online yourselves. Sensorama, this was the first immersive experience, movie experience system that was built where you actually put on headphones, put your head inside a uh, system and kind of experienced a movie from a virtual pair of eyes. You could have wind blown at you with scents. And this is the first, uh, first attempt at placing you in all senses uh, of the word virtually into another uh, reality or virtuality. And then on, there's been a lot of work, but it's only until 92 that augmented reality came in. And you'll see during the course of this lecture why it was so many years or so many decades from 57 to 92 that augmented reality actually stepped in as a term and, and, and came in as a, as a field. And it has a lot to do with technology. So you can imagine that virtuality has all to do with computer graphics and placing you in a virtual world, but things get a bit more challenging when you want to start placing real objects in a virtual world or virtual objects into a real world. There's a lot more that goes on, and those technologies were just not present in the early 60s. So, of course, this work continued a lot uh, with the AR toolkit in 99, which was kind of a library that allowed you to know exactly where you are with respect to the real world, which allows you then to start placing virtual objects in there, and since that point, it's basically skyrocketed with mobile applications and mobile devices becoming so powerful that you can actually have very strong AR applications running on very simple mobile phones nowadays. So this was not at all possible, of course, in the 60s. Um, so what are the main issues that one deals with when you're talking of virtual reality or augmented reality? Um, first of all, let's consider virtual reality. You have the entire pipeline that creates the virtual world, your, your graphics world, basically. And now you need to display it, but display it not just on a screen of some sort, but perhaps more immersively, perhaps using glasses, some kind of displays, the head-mounted displays or something, we'll come to these later, something that immerses me visually into this, into this world. So there's the display aspect of it, and, and, and combining the computer graphics into my eyes, so to say, to make me virtually place there. The second is, um, you can place me virtually um, at a certain spot within the graphical world, but in a virtual environment where I need to move around and look around and explore it, you need to know where I am. Where is my head in this virtual environment? Where am I? As I move, you need to track me. You need to know where are my eyes looking so that you can generate the right graphics to show on my eyes. If you are using other kinds of displays, you need to adapt these displays to show it from my perspective. And you can imagine, if you're looking at an object and you move around it virtually, you should be able to see it from different perspectives. And that's exactly what's needed. And that's the entire tracking registration. 
And all of this gets even harder when you're talking of augmented reality. So this, this is just the steps of difficulty. So in virtual reality, just to define it, it is about really, and there are multiple definitions, it's really about immersing the viewer into a virtual environment such that in all senses I should feel totally immersed. I should perceive as if I am in that virtual environment. The more realistic the virtual environment, the more seamless this transition I have from reality to virtuality. And in terms of all senses, it includes in principle touch, smell, um, as well as visual and auditory. Right? And this tactile or, or factory, we are not going to discuss these aspects of augmenting. We are going to look at the visual aspect in this first part alone. So as I said, there are lots of definitions and one can look into them oneself. Um, and there are four main key uh, elements, so to say, or problems, that is. One of them is, of course, in a virtual world, you need to, to generate this pipeline or the video to, to create uh, this graphical world from my perspective. There's the immersion, both physical and mental, that is psychological. I should seamlessly feel fitted into this virtual environment. There should not be a disconnect between myself and this graphical world that I live in. And sensory feedback, as I said, visual, oral, haptic, all kinds of things, and these makes it very difficult. And the last part, of course, is, um, is the environment passive or interactive? So if I'm just observing computer graphics world, the world that happens to people walk past, all virtually created, and nothing, no, nothing interacts with me, I can't have an impact on something. If I pick up something, it doesn't react to me touching it or picking it up, then it's very fake again. So interactivity is a very key aspect to bring realism to your virtual reality uh, use case or application. So these are all, let's say, ongoing challenges, ongoing research problems that people are addressing even today. Um, we talked earlier of displays. I said it's very important to be able to display the virtual content or whatever content to me, to my two eyes. And we walk around with two eyes perceiving the world in stereo all the time, perceiving depth, perceiving disparities as things are at different distances. And all of this needs to be also provided as visual input to our eyes when we are in a virtual or augmented world. This means I need to know constantly where I am, where am I looking, and then give two different video inputs for my left and the right eye, and this actually helps me more immersively and seamlessly integrate into this visual world. Um, there are various ways. One is head-mounted displays, as you've just seen. The other is actually to have a room, something like the holodeck on Star Trek. Right? You walk into this room and suddenly the room just gets virtually uh, rendered, let's say. So each, each plane, each floor, wall, ceiling is, is a screen and you walk into this projected screen of some sort and as you walk around, it knows where you are. So that's a tracking and re registration problem we spoke of. So it knows where you are, where you're looking and as you walk around, it actually changes all the graphics that are projected or displayed on these screens so that it looks seamless to, to you as if it is, um, you know, in your walking around in this environment. And the larger the room, the harder things get, the faster computationally everything has to be rendered. And of course, then you have the problem simultaneously of displaying everything in three dimensions because you need to be having some kind of perhaps polarized glasses of some sort so that you can actually perceive depth and 3D objects around you. And this is really, one can think of it, at, at least at some sense, of some kind of an environment map, but stereographic environment map of the room or the space you are in. Now, rendering these things for computer graphics worlds is relatively easy. The problem is relatively easy. The tech, tech challenge, of course, is the engineering of generating all of this in real time, because any lag between my movement and the display is going to cause this application to not perceive or not be perceived as realistic. Um, and there's been a lot of work in developing such cave systems, right? So this is really um, a cave augmented virtual environment. And here's another one where you actually have two caves where two individuals remotely, uh, at two remote locations, so not in the same space, can actually interact with each other or interact with this environment that they are both simultaneously placed in. So though you are in, and this is the, one of the advantages of uh, virtual reality, is multiple people in different locations with the same technology can be co-located virtually in the same environment. And they can all interact with each other as well as the, uh, the environment that they are placed in, uh, totally, uh, though they are in different locations. So that there's, there's been a lot of work, again, in kind of virtual co uh, workspaces or environments. And the same that you can say, this is a very hard challenge to put myself into an entire environment. Um, one of the advantages of the cave system is you're using your eyes with just polarized glasses. You don't need something heavy on your eyes that kind of intervenes or is not so ubiquitous. 
Um, but one step further away, as you can see in this image here, there are two people with their polarized glasses looking at a tabletop. So this is basically, um, I, I look at my environment, I see a tabletop, but the tabletop is actually a down uh, back projected screen. And if you project, three, use a 3D projector basically to project stereoscopic images, which, which, which are automatically filtered by your glasses, then you can actually have the feeling of a 3D model with which you can actually talk with each other and annotate and interactively work um, together. And this is one of the, uh, again, immersive uh, desks, desk spaces to work with. Totally virtual environments again. So these are, let's say, some of the examples of virtual reality. And um, there are lots of open questions here. Um, how can you add manipulation? That means if I have a virtual object in my space, I, if I need to pick it up, how do I do that? Is it, as, is it seamless? Can the virtual environment system, you need to actually understand that my hand reaches out for something and picks up something. That means you need to track me in my full body, understand my gesture, understand what I'm picking up, how am I holding it to make it actually interact with me in a realistic manner. And this is manipulation is a very hard problem. And the second is of course vape finding that is tracking me constantly, knowing where I'm going, how I'm going to go around objects, things like that. And finally, of course, is the measurement. How do you know how good is this illusion or how good am I feeling realistically immersed in this virtual environment. So these are some of the, let's say, the, the hottest topics in virtual reality. Um, the next step, as I said, going away, of course, is augmented virtuality. Now, this is something that people don't talk about normally. You talk of virtual reality, augmented reality, but augmented virtuality is that in-between step where you say, in virtual reality, I immerse myself in a virtual environment. Augmented reality is I in immerse virtual objects in a real environment. And augmented virtuality is where I immerse real objects in a virtual environment. So look at it as, as a truth table with, you know, virtual, 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 real, real, virtual. And of course, real, real would be reality. So augmented virtuality is really, um, you can imagine of situations where you have a, a virtual computer, you have a virtual screen and a virtual room and a television screen there, but the screen is playing real content of a real environment. So you're kind of immersing real objects into a virtual world or somehow you interact with real objects and the virtual world starts reacting to it and you're going to see an example of it right away so there's as i said lots of examples in, in inserting real video or factory where you direct smells you you kind of give the impression of coffee smell just because you're seeing a virtual coffee machine or a kitchen with a coffee machine um, haptics is of course to, uh, uh, the heat lamp that you to switch on when someone comes close and touches it uh, turning on a fan because virtually you've switched on some fans, so giving this feedback, haptic feedback of air being blown at you when you switch on something or heat. These are examples. Um, I'm going to play you a little video here of augmented virtuality, um, and it's pretty fun. The idea here is it's called Color Splat, and there's a video link there on YouTube to look at them. The idea is you have a virtual world that's projected on a screen in front of you, and you have a deflated football. Um, and what the thing is doing is, is tracking this football as it's thrown at the screen. And what it's actually doing is cast, tracking the shadow that is cast by the football on the screen, uh, just a technicality. And when the ball goes and hits the screen, um, it basically computes its orientation, uh, direction of throw and velocity to some extent, and then creates this fake blue ball that continues flying. So this is... This is the shadow that's actually being projected onto the screen as the ball goes towards it. That's what it uses to track the shadow. And on the other side, using the tracked shadow, it knows the projectile uh, trajectory of the ball and therefore then continues by saying, okay, if I can catch this ball in, in the air going towards the screen, then I can start rendering a fake ball, a virtual ball into this virtual uh, world that is. And then you're basically trying to uh, of course, you can cheat it by hitting on the screen directly and fake casting shadows. Um, but the idea is to uh, create this virtual ball that continues on. And actually, um, a while ago, I remember this now, there was, there was a, a f kind of an indoor golf range to train your uh, whatever it's called, your hit or putt or whatever. Um, and you could actually take the golf bat and uh, golf stick and really hit this ball. It would go and hit a screen. And they had a lot of camera sensors there tracking the ball, tracking its speed, its trajectory, basically. And, you know, simple projectile motion, parabolic motion. They would traject create this, this trajectory. And on a virtual screen in front of you, the ball would then continue on and hit 
some go towards the hole in this virtual golf course. So it was actually a real golf ball, a real golf stick that you would hit with and train yourselves towards getting the right distance and position um, of, of getting the golf clubs, the balls hit in the, in, into the hole. So this is again an example of augmented virtuality because you're using real objects that interact with the virtual world and then something happens in the virtual, virtual world. And there's, there's, for augmented virtuality, there's a lot of applications. I mean, uh, video conferencing, where you create a virtual world for a video room, for some kind of a teleconference, you as if all of you are seated in this virtual computer graphics rendered room, and each one of you is rendered, you, you know, you're, you're captured in your room, like a Skype camera looking at you, it removes the background, and then places you virtually in this thing. In this earlier thing, they had each of them shown as a little screen, but of course it doesn't make it as realistic, but today one can imagine using something like the Kinect, you just remove off the person from the background and project him or her seated at this virtual table. And then uh, each one of you wears glasses, which is immersed in this virtual room, and so you actually look at the room as if, oh, there's a room around me and these people are seated at this table. The challenge is, of course, rendering the graphics good enough to match with the realistic image lighting of the person in the other room. So the challenge here is, uh, is what one, I would say a computer vision challenge of getting the lighting and the illumination uh, to be coherent be between the virtual worlds and the real worlds. And that's, that's huge. It's non-trivial again. The final step of this continuum is augmented reality, just before we come to reality, is augmented reality. And, and this is basically about inserting virtual objects in a real world. And you can imagine that I have a table around me, I have th chairs around me, and I wish to place an object on it. It's typically done in the past that you, you would have some kind of a marker and, and use the marker to, to uh, you know, place an object. And earlier I talked of the Sensorama video, so maybe I'll show you that video first. This is the, you know, the first real augmented reality. It's a bit long by Morton Hiley. This is a bit, bit long video, so I might have to skip it at some point. Um, and this is an old interview with him. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty um, old-fashioned video. And here it is. This is you know, really an old stuff, right? So it's kind of a car rally that you're, there's a camera that's recorded it, and you sit into this little cabin, the cabin you'll see a bit later, and you're immersively looking at this world through the camera, and it's, it's just very passive. It's, you're not really doing anything. You're just watching a movie. But all that it also added, so they have different kind of movies, you could put coins in to, to look at the different kinds of movies. And, um, and of course, so here, here you can see there's a helicopter ride and some other stuff. And um, that's where you put your coins in to, to like a video booth, really. Um, and the idea is to, uh, you can look at it, look at it. And it has a little fan at the back that blows the air based on the content on, in the movie and even creates some smells. And the idea is, of course, it's full 3D because two views wide vision, stereo, stereo sound, aroma, wind, vibrations. And this is kind of, you sit into this thing and you're transported into this virtual world or real, remote, real, realistic world because it's really um, uh, um, two cameras recording a real environment somewhere else and you just put on this suit that immerses you into that, that world. So, so that's, that's, that's him actually sitting there and, and, and using his Sensorama, one of the first um, augmented reality or remote reality, so to say, um, systems. So you can you can look you can you can Google for Sensorama or YouTube search it, and you'll actually get the same video with audio. It'll be much more interesting. So um, what's what's the challenge? What's the big difference between virtual reality and augmented reality? I said earlier that of course for virtual reality you need to have some kind of head-mounted display to immersively put you into this virtual environment. And this is, of course, the same also in augmented reality. Um, and I said there is this tracking where you need to know where is the viewer with respect to this virtual environment that you've created. And that's about tracking me or the user as I move around and turn around and look in different directions. The, the harder part of augmented reality is that I look at the world through my real eyes, perhaps, and I need to now augment what I see with graphics. That means I need to show something on my in front of the two eyes that is geometrically coherent with the geometry of the scene. I need to therefore know what is the world like before I can add graphical objects into it. You can imagine a, a simple thing where I have head-mounted displays, but then to perfectly align what the camera sees with what my eyes see is very difficult. 
especially because uh, you can foveate your eyes. That means as I look at something far away, my eyes are pretty straight, but as I look at some focus on something close by, my eyes come together again or closer in. And to understand this so that I can correctly put the graphical image of that virtual object for each eye in the right space so that they appear fused in my brain at the right location is very challenging. Okay, so there's a, uh, within augmented reality, there's an entire, let's say, again, a continuum of the perfect augmented reality where really my virtual objects are 3D co-located in the scene and perfectly displayed for the two eyes to simple things like something in the distance on the horizon, it's so far away that the geometrical alignment is no longer uh, necessary. Uh, this, this is all about stereographic imaging and computer vision, and it's really about at what technology am I using for display, what are its limitations, and therefore what kinds of augmentation can I actually do. Um, there's an entire space of head-mounted displays and, uh, and generating, looking at, looking at the screen either through, through little glasses with, with a little reflected, uh, uh, re reflected imagery of it, or looking at the world through cameras. So here's an example where you actually, um, you have two cameras in front of your eyes and they have displays behind them. You don't see the real world directly with your eyes. You see what the cameras see. And therefore you're looking at two screens effectively of the two cameras. And then it's easy because the cameras capture the image of the world. And when you process something in that image and place something geometrically in that two stereoscopic views, that's what the eyes see. And therefore you're looking through the camera's perspective. So it's completely fine. And you can achieve through such displays perfect augmented reality experience. Of course, it's a question of how ubiquitous it is. That means how uncomfortable I feel holding or wearing something that's heavy and bulky and looking through uh, a camera's imagery. Um, if you've taken a course in computer vision or if you've heard of high dynamic range, this might be an if impact because when you look at the world around, you see millions of intensity levels and a camera can only show you 255, 256 intensity levels. So these things, of course, start interfering with the realism of the impact. And here's, let's say, the, one of the first head-mounted displays uh, where the cameras captured the video and then used uh, uh, glasses, semi -ref uh, half reflecting glasses to project it onto you. So you can imagine this is way back in 1968. Since then, of course, things have gone a long way. They don't look so geeky anymore and um, they're getting cooler and cooler. And this is the biggest impact that one has to have to make something that is acceptable socially as well. So there's a lot of applications to augmented reality early back way in the early 90s. Uh, some work at Columbia University was actually, um, they would call it the Turing machine, and it was basically Turing, like Turing around the space. Um, and you had, they had a complete 3D model, uh, geo-registered 3D model of the world. They had a GPS uh, antenna on, in the backpack, a computer in the backpack, and your augmented reality glasses. And as you walked around, it knew exactly where you are and where, which orientation you're looking, and it would start labeling the real world with annotations. And this is the early augmented reality where you didn't do things like object recognition and recognizing the buildings and therefore being able to label it. It really required to know exactly where you are and what you're looking at and then have a map of the world around you in order to do these annotations. It could also do things like um, uh, playing back of documentaries, playing back in history, what happened in a specific scene. You could play back and relive it, standing there as a bystander, seeing what happened, of course, from the perspective of the camera at that point. Um, so it, it had all of these aspects of annotation and playback, and this is the situated documentary aspect of it. Um, right, and then moving on, of course, a big application of augmented reality is in education and training and medical uh, augmented reality, where you actually want to assist the driver, and this is, this is coming, so all of these technologies, of course, first come in the military, so you can imagine aircraft fighter pilots having all kinds of annotations on them to make them see beyond what their eyes see. Um, so IR information and other information, uh, radar information graphically shown so that they, it helps them. Uh, and the same thing in medical AR, you can imagine this uh, is not for the faint hearted, but you can imagine um, looking at the patient but having annotations and graphics put on it, um, real time, uh, uh, how do you say, vital statistics of the patient being projected so the doctor is constantly aware and more aware than what he actually sees. So being more, uh, more information is fed to you by, by augmentations so that it doesn't interfere with what you're looking at, but still is perfectly located on the different parts of, of the human body, let's say, as you're operating. So, so here's, here's the medical operation, uh, me medical augmented reality example. 
Um, to more simplistic examples, it's of course a cooperative work environment where you're working, you're working with real objects, and then of course you might want to say, here's my machine part, and to explain to something how the airflow affects this engine or something, you can actually virtually, wearing your glasses, show the airflow going through this machine part or turbine that you're holding up, and it kind of graphically renders what's happening for you. And this is one way of augmenting our real object with virtual airflow and graphics so that both of you wearing these glasses, looking at the same object, see the same thing from different perspectives. So again, all the tracking and everything else, but not only that, you also need to track and register what you're holding up in your hand because you could hold it in any perspective, any, any pose, and you still need to be able to show the graphics correctly from the different perspectives. So these are all the problems, let's say, in such augmented reality collaborative environments. Um, but augmented reality is not just about um, video. So most of the times when you talk about virtual reality and augmented reality, the first thing that comes to mind is visual immersion in a virtual or real space. Um, but you can imagine, as I said before, it's tactile, it's haptic, it's uh, olfactory, as well as auditory. And real immersion in a virtual and augmented environment includes auditory as well. Uh, I'm not going to be covering the audio part. That's going to be covered next time by, by Jens Ahrens. What I'm going to do is give a little bridge, a little project that I had in my augmented reality class with some students. Uh, and the idea here is that you're looking at a screen, and that's what's shown you. Unfortunately, we can't display or demo it to you right now through this video, especially not. The idea, what you can see on the left, is someone wearing st uh, headphones reading a book. And what you see in the small inset on that, in that image is basically that e-book that he's reading. What we have is an eye tracker constantly checking out where the person is looking. And based on that, we know what part of the text the person is reading. And what, the, what we created here is a annotation tool where you can actually take an e-book such as Alice in Wonderland or something and annotate it to have auditory soundtrack. Okay, so if the text, if you're reading the text that says, oh, so-and-so was running down the staircase, down the underground staircase, and as he was running down, the, he just missed the train or something like that. If that's the situation, you can give an auditory feedback to the person as, the, as he's reading it, you can hear footsteps running down, you can hear a train going past you, and all of this in terms of spatial audio. So binaural spatial audio, where you could actually, so what the system does is actually create the soundtrack of the trains, and, and you're running down, down, down the staircase, and the train actually whizzes past you, you know, at a distance, it gives you the spatial and immersion in this audio world. And of course, the challenge here is to uh, track your gaze smoothly to understand when you look away and look back at the text that the sounds don't st cut in and cut out uh, abruptly to make it more uh, or less, make it less nauseating really, to make it more uh, pleasing to the senses. So this is, let's say, using the eye tracker technology which could be used for augmented reality in a visual sense and using it for audio immersive augmented reality.